all in my name. I should be walking with the immortal, no feasting with the heroes of all time. I'd say it was your manifest destiny not to. to the Mad Max Minute, where we walk with the Immorta McFeasting on Mad Max Fury Road one minute at a time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minute 64, which begins with Nux expounding on where warboys hope to go when they die, and it ends with Toast holding a pathetic amount of ammunition. Happy Monday, Rick. Happy Monday. It has been so long since it was just the two of us, like an entire month, that I had three episodes of the you are awaited podcast to catch up on and i had a diminishing amount of observations as i went on like three observations for the first episode two for the second one for the third so i don't think it'll take us the entire episode to go over it but as we'll start to see as these minutes go on this is essentially a transition week we're moving into fury road's blue period speaking of classical art though In episode 17, Yuri and Travis were talking about Furiosa calling Max Fool, and they felt that that was pretty much a reference to the idea of a Shakespearean fool, the character on stage in a Shakespearean play who fits all of the regular traits of like a court jester and whatnot, but also is the kind of person that the rank and file attendees can most identify with that they will pick out as their favorite character so yes she's calling him fool because he's stubborn but it could also be seen as this classical shout out i like that idea because max while he is relatable to the rank and file like you mentioned as far as being of the entertaining variety he is the antithesis (laughs) so it does feel a bit like poking fun by Furiosa. Like, there is no fun or entertainment in Max at all. Plus, when you think of a fool in a play, in the jester archetype, a lot of the times they're talking truth to power, and Max is never afraid to talk truth to power. I'm thinking specifically of his interactions with Auntie. Yes, and Papa Gallo as well. And Fifi. In all three movies, there are specific examples of him speaking truth to power. Yeah. When they got to the part where Furiosa was in the canyon, they were talking about how Furiosa went about setting up this deal. And they were wondering, how does an Imperator end up striking up a deal with the Rock Riders? And they thought of this fun idea of maybe there's a Moss Eisley Cantina type place in either Gastown or the Bullet Farm. And on one of her supply trips out, she stopped into one of these places and met up with these guys. And I really like the idea of just a generic gathering place that people can come into and visit, especially in a place like Gastown. Because you know people are coming for miles around to trade with Gastown. I like the idea that Gastown doesn't only do business with the Citadel and the Bullet Farm. They have business of their own, like the Rock Riders and probably the buzzards as well, that they are just a business town and their loyalties don't necessarily only go towards Joe. Their loyalties are for selling their product. I imagine that despite Joe being so stingy with his food, with his water, that the people eater is all about trading, getting stuff in from out of the wasteland and keeping people coming back. Because you've got to get your stuff from somewhere. You can't just always rely on the other pillars of the triumvirate for everything. you got to be self-sufficient in at least a few ways. Yeah, Max was an independent, and his car was running just fine. Mm -hmm. He had plenty of fuel, so he had to have gotten it from somewhere. I can imagine the bullet farm being a little bit more cagey, a little more standoffish when it comes to outsiders which is probably why they wouldn't have a place for everybody to hang out. Yeah, I agree. 
ammunition is just a different type of commodity. Gasoline fuel is irreplaceable. Well, that's not exactly true. I mean, Max replaced fuel in the last movie with camels. So fuel is replaceable. But so is ammunition. There are plenty of people who use crossbows as their form of hunting, as their form of defense. So not everybody needs bullets. And the bullet farmer doesn't need to sell to everybody. Mm -hmm. So moving on to the last point that I noticed in episode 17. It's not really Mad Max related. Well, it is, but... Uh, apparently, one of them took a trip down to the Andes, and uh, when you take a trip down to South America, they can make you tea, and the tea will contain cocoa leaves, which is basically, it's a cocaine tea. So you drink that in the morning, and like the best coffee you've ever had, it'll keep you up, alert, and energetic all day. I'm sure. But they went from that into saying that the Rock Riders are... Some of them kind of looked like mountain goats, which the Rock Rider Chief definitely, I can see that with the horns in his helmet. But it makes sense that the Rock Riders who live and die on these cliff faces would, of course, take after mountain goats. Yeah, I like that comparison. Yeah. Uh, moving on, as we went into the section where the truck lit on fire and they had to extinguish it with the sand, they really liked where... The air intakes open and suck in all of that air after the flames have gone out. And they said that it sounded a lot like the war rig gasping for air after holding its breath. And it was a really good moment where the war rig got to be a character in and of itself. Yeah. I don't think we talk enough about the war rig as a character, as a personality, with a history all its own and a future all its own. So I really like that imagery of the war rig gasping for breath. And speaking of vehicles, they also noticed that the three heads of the triumvirate, so Joe the Bullet Farmer from the Bullet Farm and the People Eater, they all ride stacked vehicles, like cars on top of cars. So the Morton Joe with his Giga Horse, obviously it's two cars stacked on top of each other. The People Eater, his limousine, is pretty much a big rig with a limousine slapped down on top of it. And the Peacemaker is a tank with a muscle car stacked on top of it. So where everybody else rides vehicles that are essentially one thing, it's a dune buggy, it's a tow truck, it's a thing stacked with speakers, it's one thing. All of the bosses get to ride stacked cars. They do, and that's very appropriate. The leader gets the best vehicles. I mean, our leader gets a freaking plane. Mm-hmm. And then the last thing I noticed from when they were talking about episode 19, this is where Nux got thrown onto the tanker. And they were talking about how mediocre is the worst thing that Joe could have said. Because Joe could have been praising Nux for his actions. He could have been cursing Nux for his inaction. But the fact that he called him mediocre, something middling, it marked him as something that is completely unworthy of even recognition. And it brought to mind something from the Bible, which that imagery is all over the place. Yes, it is. Revelation 3.16. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That's harsh. Yeah. Those are harsh words. That idea in life of be something. Yeah. Anything. Whatever it is, be it. And mediocre is nothing. You're right. It really is quite insulting. More so than we initially thought, at least. That's for sure. I think so. Getting into the minute proper, we join Nux and Capable in the back of the tanker, and we're looking at Nux specifically, and he's talking about how three times the gates of Valhalla were opened to him. And here at the top of minute 64, he talks about how they were calling his name and how he should be in that afterlife right now. He should be walking with the Immorta and McFeasting with the heroes of all time. I listened to this so many times, and I confirmed with you that what you had written down was, like, accurate. I like that you wrote down Immorta, like, the plural of Immortan. Mm -hmm. So it kind of says that Joe is not the only Immortan. He is a class of being, like gods, like the Greek and Roman pantheon. You have a singular god, but you have a whole bunch of gods. 
and you may interact with one in a story, but there's a whole bunch more. So we're just interacting with one Immortan. So there are a plethora of Immorta. I just, the whole McFeasting thing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I listened to it, and I wish that I had listened to it before I saw the subtitles. Mm. Because all I could hear then was McFeasting. But that's not what he's saying. It can't be. Why not? Because it's stupid. I mean, I know, okay. <laughs> I know that there have been times in the past, I'm thinking specifically of Ace saying Aquacola, like it's a bastardization of an old brand name, it feels like. It feels like they're taking the idea of liquid refreshment of Coca-Cola and applying it to water. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that they could be taking the idea of McDonald's and applying it to feasting. But it sounds stupid. At least Aquacola sounds cool. Well, we've learned in recent years that McDonald's is more than just a fast food chain. I looked up the history of that restaurant chain in Australia. They opened their first restaurant in the Sydney suburbs of Yaguna in 1971. And since then, they've opened over 970 locations in Australia. So... They've still got a way to go before they reach the sheer amount of saturation that we have here in America, but it is very much a thing. And apparently it's not just for the rank and file anymore. Even the highest seats of power in some countries, like our own, see McDonald's as something that you can serve in formal events. So, of course, the legend would persist through the end of the world. That actually reminds me of something... Just the other day, you informed me that somebody on Reddit had scanned in the novelizations of the first three movies. And I was like, holy cow, I want those. So you sent them to me. So I started reading number one, and I haven't gotten that far. I've been super busy, but I did get far enough that they're talking about this future where all of the food comes off a production line. They're talking specifically about there's no more cows grazing in the fields because they're not needed anymore all of the food is produced in factories now there's no more real food so that kind of makes me think of this mcfeasting idea that maybe in the future fast food and production line food mass produced created food rather than grown food is the food the only food so Maybe as prevalent as McDonald's and that genre of food is now, maybe in their dystopian future and on their way to the dystopian future, it's even more. Mm. All right. I think I might be able to get behind the idea that he actually says McFeasting. <laughs> I'm glad. Because <laughs> you think that's really actually what he says? Yeah. That's what the subtitle said. I downloaded the subtitles directly from a disc rip. So those are what pop up when you watch the movie with subtitles. Okay. But it also gives us a glimpse of what the war boys aspire to. Yes, they want to go to Valhalla and be shiny and chrome. But once you get to Valhalla, apparently you walk with the Immorta of old, which Joe has yet to say to us the viewing audience, that there were other Immorta before him. But apparently that's what he's telling the War Boys, that he is just one of this race of Immorta because they just don't know any better and that his race live in Valhalla, that they can go spend time with him, like a wizard from Lord of the Rings or something like that. And that, yeah, you go to Valhalla, shiny chrome, then you get to make feast with the heroes of all time. It's what they want. And it's nice to have a little bit of illustration to go with all of this witness me type stuff yeah it is it's nice to have some clarification on what is going through nux's mind and why he is so devastated right now because he's missing out on a party he's been missing out on mickey d's according to the mcdonald's australia website the nickname for mickey d's down in australia is maccas maccas Gonna go down to Maccas, grab some, grab some bagus. That was probably the wrong accent, so I'm just gonna push forward and say that Capable fires back, saying that 
she thinks that it was his destiny not to do that. She doesn't specifically say destiny. She says manifest destiny. Yeah, I found her choice of words to be a little bit odd. Yeah. Manifest destiny. I'm not sure if it's like this in the rest of the world, but to Americans, the term manifest destiny is attached to a very specific idea that we started on the eastern coast, taking over all the land and growing, gaining independence from Britain. And it was our manifest destiny to cross to the Pacific and to take over all the land between the two coasts. Yeah. When I looked up Manifest Destiny, I was aware of this 19th century idea that white Americans were going to press from coast to coast and it was theirs by divine right sort of thing. Yeah, I was going to say there is a certain amount of divinity applied to the idea of Manifest Destiny. Yeah. It's not what I would call the best policy for the people that were already on the American continent. Mm -hmm. They uh, definitely got the short end of the stick, which is a very nice way of describing their genocide and relocation and destruction of their homeland and their culture and their relegation to isolated reservations and the Trail of Tears and Andrew Jackson and all of that stuff. Hey, you know... Every country has a sordid past when you really think about it. And that is one of ours. I'm not aware of the idea of Manifest Destiny extending to Australia. So I'm hoping some of our listeners might be able to weigh in on that and let me know. Yeah, I would definitely like to hear what other people around the world, if Manifest Destiny has a certain connotation to other cultures besides our own American culture. Yeah, because... America and Australia, two vastly different groupings of biomes. Yes, with some similarities. Certainly, in places. When it comes to things surrounding Manifest Destiny. Yeah, so I'm just wondering if those early settlers of Australia thought that they're just going to come in and take over the entire place. Because frankly, that's what settlers that come from England do. England has a great track record of just sending people across the world and taking over. Do you think perhaps the idea of Manifest Destiny was rather British in nature as opposed to American in nature? Mm, it's hard to say. It I is hard to say. I haven't researched it. No. So I can't say one way or the other. I've reached the limits of what I remember from social studies. Yeah. I think it's safe to say that Capable heard the phrase Manifest Destiny in one of her history books, though. I think she is definitely showing her education here. Mm. She's also showing a lot of compassion, which we have noted her showing before. This is not out of character for her. I really love that she lays down next to him. Gets on his level. Yeah, he is obviously suffering, and she has this drive to help him, this innate compassion, She doesn't think so highly of herself that she won't get down on his level, both physically by laying down next to him and emotionally and intellectually. She is there for him emotionally instead of just serving her own needs. Hmm. I think this might be the first male interaction she's had that has been like this. I agree, and I think this is the first female interaction that he has had that has been like this. Mm. So they're really exploring a whole new world. This is their magic carpet ride. Yes. So Nux continues about how he believed that he was being spared for something bigger, that he was going to accomplish something. He got to drive the pursuit vehicle, and the two tumors that are growing on his neck even stopped, as he put it, chewing at his windpipe. And we get introduced to Larry and Barry as he points them out. Yes, we do. And if they don't get him, the night fevers will. Yeah, we brought up the subject of night fevers back when we were initially talking about the spray. And I can't remember exactly what we said way back then, but I was wondering if the night fevers were sort of a symptom of the cancer that is ravaging all of these war boys that just falling ill to... The night fevers is just something that happens as the war boys' immunities break down because of the apparent leukemia that they have. And so Nux has probably seen 
a whole slew of war boys succumbing to these night fevers. So you think he hasn't experienced them yet for himself? I don't think so. I think it represents an inevitability, one that he's seen and not been subjected to yet. Do you think there's any possibility that they are attempting to treat the cancer with any sort of radiation therapy? I don't believe so. I think they're doing blood transfusions and that's it. Yeah. Because night fevers put me in mind of the sickness that comes along with chemotherapy and radiation therapy. That it takes a toll on your body and it's awful. It's doing just as much damage to you that it is to your cancer. But the cancer alone is going to wreak havoc on his body Mm -hmm. and have all sorts of side effects. Yeah, I think those tumors on his neck, when he talks about them chewing at his windpipe, they're growing and the organic mechanic has probably told him that those tumors are going to grow until they choke him. That is grim. Well, That is an awful thing to know. You know firsthand exactly how much damage swelling things can cause. Absolutely. That's why yep. I'm not allowed to sneak up on you on, from one <laughs> angle. And it, it really it does not take long for things in your body to get affected by being next to a tumor and pressure being put on nerves and veins and arteries. It doesn't take long for that stuff to take effect. Mm-hmm. So once again, we're just reminded that Nux is very much on borrowed time. Capable reaches her hand out and touches Nux's lips. Why do you think she does this? I think she's testing the waters. Yeah? She's coming from a situation where her only male interaction was one of domination and abuse. And I think she's reaching out to Nux to see how he's going to react. How he's going to treat her if she initiates contact in some way. Okay. I like that idea. I, too, thought of curiosity. I think she is a bit curious about his scars. Mm Mm-hmm. She obviously has seen scarification. She has it on her own back. She saw it on all of the fellow wives' backs, and then Angherit on her face. So she's no stranger to scarification. But Nux's scarification is way more extensive than anything she has seen. I really like the idea of Capable's horizons being expanded. Mm. She is learning about someone else's culture, Even though technically it's her culture as well, but it's just not an aspect she's had experience with. Yeah. And she is experiencing somebody who is actively dying and someone who is in the depths of despair. These just aren't things that she is accustomed to. Plus, Capable is without someone to take care of right now. And it could just be that she's replacing Angherid with Nux as someone to look after. Because he's in a very vulnerable position right now, and so she might be reaching out to almost like, hey, you know, don't worry, war boy, I'll take care of you. Don't be cry. I very much agree with you. I try to be careful along that line of thought because I don't want to see capable as someone who is just filling a void with one person after another and using those people to fill that void for her own fulfillment rather than genuinely taking care of people. I don't want her to be that way. I want her to see people who are suffering, see people who need her and recognize that she has the abilities to contribute. Mm -hmm. And though therefore she does, but she really does seem to need someone to take care of. Yeah. What's nice is that as we go along, we're going to see Nux and Capable's relationship, I guess, evolve over time. Like here, it's very, rudimentary it's very entry level like they're just getting to know each other and as we go on we'll see how they interact in the future and side note before we leave this scene she was sent back there to look out and watch behind them yeah she's not doing that you could argue that she was sent out back to watch for war boys and she is watching a war boy (laughs) which is technically what she was sent back there to do Yes. I have one more thing before we leave this scene. Okay. Do you notice how wide Nux's pupils are? They're ginormous. Yeah. In production, I suppose they probably gave him something to dilate his eyes, or their contacts that are just black. 
But in universe, it's from the spray. He's high. That's a good point. See, I figured it was because he was hiding down in this enclosure in the shadows. I didn't even think that the spray was dilating his pupils to make them huge. So I do get the idea that they are in a dark ish place. I mean, it's not that dark to us, but it can't be, yeah. you know, I mean, the sun's going, they have down. to let us see. So I'm comparing her pupils to his pupils. Her pupils are smaller. Her pupils are an appropriate size for an appropriate light level. His pupils are dilated. Hmm. Well, in that case, it's good that it's about to get dark out. <laughs> yes, he cannot be comfortable. But before the sun actually goes down, we are going to cut back into the rig for a little bit. We'll find the dag. She's tracing shapes on the ceiling. And Toast is looking at an abysmally small amount of ammunition. We're talking two or three shotgun shells, a bunch of small rounds of ammunition. Just not a great collection if you are planning on doing any sort of fighting. It is a shocking wake-up call Mm -hmm. to see. Because they were using ammunition like it was going out of style during the fights leading up to this. And now it's like, oof, they've made that bed. Now they've got to lie in it. But we'll talk more about that on Wednesday because we've reached the end of today's minute. So come back in a few days when Toast will offer her assessment on their current stock of ammo. The war rig is going to start swerving. And before long, it'll just be stuck in the mud. The Mad Max Minute Podcast is a fan project by Rick and Julia Ingham. The Mad Max franchise was created by George Miller and Byron Kennedy, is presented by Kennedy Miller Mitchell Productions, and distributed by Warner Brothers. Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is Verdi's Dies Irae by Daniel Batista of DanielBatista.com. Our home on the internet is MadMaxMinute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MadMaxMinute, like us on Facebook by searching for Mad Max Minute, and join our Facebook listener group, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit MadMaxMinute.com, where you can see what's in our Tee Public store, join our Patreon, or even donate to the show to help us keep the tanks full. Thank you for joining us for Minute 64 of Fury Road. We'll see you next time.